Since 1980, uh, yeah. Ronald, well, let's say since the, the present administration in Washington has been in office, uh, there's been a lot of problems with all the farmers in the United States, and there's been little or no assistance from the United States government. Do you feel that the government, uh, the federal government and the state government should be more of an assistance to farmers in this country? Well, I think they could help out a little bit. Uh, you know, it would be nice, even on a poor year like this, if they came along and uh, subsidized us to a point where, you know, we could uh, cover our expenses, you know. Uh, this year, we're not even going to be able to cover our expenses, really. You know, we're going to have to reach in our own pockets for it. Uh, I think it would be, uh, I think it would be nice if somehow or another they could uh, subsidize us so that we could get at least the cost of production back out of our uh, crop. What do you think about Reagan and his uh, policies? You think he's wrong? Uh, I don't know. I don't like to talk too much about politics. Mm -hmm. uh, he's had some good things. I mean, he's he's done a few good things. Uh, he's done done some things that make you scratch your head, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But other than that, I don't really I don't really like to talk too much about yeah. politics. Do you feel that? Uh, They'll always be farming on Long Island? I think there'll be some sort of farming, sure. Whether you, you know, it could even come to a point where you're, uh, then there is a lot of building out here and a lot of houses going up all over. Uh, a few guys I know have started planting nursery stock, so, you know, with all the, and the landscapers seem to uh, be doing quite well and they're always looking for trees and things like that so you know maybe maybe you might have to plant a few acres of nursery stock too you know I don't know uh, there's some uh, like you can privet hedge and black pines and stuff like that you know you're not tying up a lot of money and uh, you can get it you can get your money back pretty quick a uh, couple couple three years and you know you can start digging them out so it's a it's a pretty good that's a pretty good return too so Maybe you might have to plant a few acres of nursery stock. I don't know. See what happens. But I think they'll be farming on Long Island. Some some sort of farming, sure. I think they'll be. Last thing. What's the biggest problem facing you as a small farmer today? Well, <clears throat> you have, uh, well, it costs a lot of money to plant, to plant a crop of potatoes. You know, if you're going to stay strictly potato farming, uh, it's a big investment. It's hard for a young guy to go to a uh, uh, creditor and get money from him be without, you know, because you, you don't have that much, uh, you don't have an, a real established line of credit. Uh, it, it's tough to get money, for one thing. Land rents are high. Uh, it, it costs a lot of money, you know, and uh, I don't think anybody that anybody could come in right off the street and go farming. Uh, myself, I was brought up in it, and I guess that's why I love it so much, and that's why I want to keep going. But uh, anybody else that could came in off the street, they would have to spend so much money to get equipped, and then they would have to turn around and spend more money to uh, plant a crop. And, uh, you know, I don't know everything there is to know about farming myself yet because I've only been farming for, say, six years. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, knowledge that you've learned.
today, Pete. Uh, maybe you just want to give us a little bit of a description about what was going on inside the, the building you were working in today. Well, we were uh, grading a trail load of potatoes. We were grading them loose. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you want me to say? It's basically what you had told me before. The potatoes you were working with were a specific kind and the other Oh, ones. yeah. Well, the ones that uh, you saw me putting in the bag and you saw my father putting in the bag, they were chefs. Uh, they'll go to a, uh, well, they'll probably go to New York Market, to Hunts Point. Um, the small ones that you saw going into the other truck there, they were, they were the seconds or the bees, a lot of people call them. They'll, uh, they go down to uh, Delaware uh, to a canning facility, and uh, the uh, number ones that went into the truck, they, they were going down to New Jersey to a repacker, and he was going to uh, repack those into fives, five-pound bags and ten-pound bags, and, uh, and, well, sell them to in New York City or down south, uh, you know, Supply chain stores with them. You Did know. any of those potatoes end up on Long Island? Uh, no, probably not. You probably won't see them back on Long Island. What potatoes do uh, people in Long Island buy? A lot of the uh, potatoes that come from, uh, uh, well, a lot of the potatoes that come on Long Island come from out west. Uh, some come from uh, Maine. It seems like everybody else's potatoes come out to Long Island. And the Long Island potatoes all go down south, or they go to Puerto Rico, or, you know, they, it seems like they're never the ones that are around here. Why is that? Uh, I don't really know. I guess it's just that, you know, the way things are, ours seem to go uh, south, and the others, well, a lot of the ones from out west and uh, from Maine, they come into Hunts Point, and from Hunts Point, they're distributed out here to uh, the local uh, food stores, uh, the peddlers. A lot of people that are in these, uh, uh, well, like have these food chains, they'll buy from the New York market. And a lot of the potatoes that go into New York market are from out west, and some from Long Island, but not, uh, not as many as from out west. This year has uh, been a pretty tough year for you and other farmers here on Long Island. What's the major cause for the the problems that you've been having this year, you feel? Well, I think that uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, there's there was so many potatoes grown in this country. Uh, there was 60,000 more acres. Um, a lot of, uh, they just planted a lot more acres and there's more or less potato glut is what it, what it boils down to. This uh, year you're making how much money per 100 pound bag as opposed to last year? Well, last year, at this time, we were making about $5 per 100 pounds, and this year, we were making about $2, and uh, that $3 that you lose, that's that's a lot of money. It's a lot, of, awful lot of money. In uh, working your land, you have a certain number of acres of land. How much does it cost you to work one acre of land how much money do you have to try to make? I mean, how much money are you making this year on one of those acres? Well, it, you, to plant an acre of potatoes, when you figure, if you're going to figure everything, you're figuring probably in between twelve and fourteen, well, twelve and fifteen hundred dollars to grow an acre of potatoes. And uh, this year, if you're only digging, say, three hundred and fifty hundred weights to the acre, we all had a pretty good crop this year, and. I imagine some crops were more than 350 and some were a little less, but if you was to average it all out, it was probably ran about 350. And you take 350 hundred weights at $2, that's only $700. So you're losing anywhere from uh, uh, five to uh, $800 an acre that you've got to come up with. And you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of guys, like myself, even, and you know, you invest all that money, and if you can't get it back, you know, it can really hurt you this year. You've been in farming for how long? You've I've been far. Long. I've been farming uh, since 1979. Uh -huh. And during that time, what kind of things have been going on leading up to this year for you? Has it been a good year, bad year? Well, 
It seemed like uh, when I first started, well, the first year I started, we sold potatoes for three dollars and fifty cents. But it didn't seem like things costed like they did today. You know, at three dollars and fifty cents, it wasn't great, but it seemed like I don't know. It, it just seemed like there was you made enough. You didn't make a real killing, but you made enough to keep going. And then I, you know, I was fortunate to have a couple of good years. I had uh, a couple of years. I sold potatoes for nine dollars. I even sold some for eleven. And uh, you know, those, those years, uh, you know, it, it was it seemed like everything was all worth it because you made a little money, put it away, and bought a piece of equipment. Or I even built my house, you know, and I built my house myself. And you know, that took a lot of the money, but. Uh, uh, I don't, you know, uh, what, what else do you want to know? <laughs> your costs that you have to pay out on some things, I mean, that what you're saying right there, things didn't cost as much as inflation, like with machinery, pesticides, fertilizer, things like that. Well, the mach your machinery costs have gone way up. Uh, when I first started, uh, like that white tractor you saw out, out in the back there <clears throat> with a cab on it, when I bought that, it ran for about $25,000. And uh, if you were to buy that same tractor today, in the same horsepower class, you're talking about $40,000, $45,000. So it just goes to show you how much things have gone up. You know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't spend that kind of money, you know, and keep farming, really. Um, pesticides, well, last couple of years, the uh, potato beetle situation was a little bit rough. Uh, this year, thank God we got that, to use that cryocide. I think that helped a lot. and uh, uh, That wasn't too awful expensive, but it was still expensive enough. Uh, when it first came out last, last summer, we used some. It wasn't so bad, the price. And uh, this year, they jacked the price up on that, too. So, you know. How much are you spending on pesticides and fertilizers? On pesticides and fertilizers? Yeah. Oh, I bet you're uh, with the pesticides and fertilizer. I bet you're spending about forty-five thousand dollars. And what'd you pay your first year? Seventy-nine. Well, probably ran my fertilizer and spray material. Probably ran about twenty-five, twenty-five thousand. So you know that's fifteen thousand dollars more. This year being a, a rough year for you. If you had a a lot of changes going out here with the farmland and things, a lot of building development and things. A lot of real estate agents called and said, uh, Yeah, I've got, I got even, a f I got a few uh, uh, cards in the mail, you know, they, s a few real estate agents said, you know, fill this card out and mail it back to me and, uh, you know, if you really, if you want to sell or you want to rent your house or something like that, they said, uh, you know, mail this card back and We'll get in touch with you. Yeah, that's happened, but I'm not interested in doing anything yet. How does yet. that make you feel when they call you? Uh, I don't know. I think they think that they have us at at their mercy, uh, and I, it'll it'll have it'll be a long while before they have me at their mercy. One way or another, I'll hang on. We were talking before about um, some of the ideas that the agricultural department of the United States has about efficiency in farming, how the larger scale farms are more efficient and that they will survive more readily than a small farm. You run a fairly small farm. How does that, what does that sound like to you? Well, you mean the, uh, the reason why the big farms, the, can they, they can survive? Yeah. Well, the big farms, uh, they, uh, they're more diversified. They'll grow. And they won't grow just potatoes, and uh, they, they'll grow. They'll grow sweet corn. Uh, they'll grow a whole bunch of different crops. And if they lose on one crop one year, that's not going to hurt them because they're so diversified. They, you know, they're growing so many other crops. So uh, what what they lose on one crop, they'll make up on another. Where we are. You know, we're just a small farm, and we can only, we're growing about 135 acres of potatoes, and I grow a few acres of vegetables myself, but, uh, you know, it's just a few acres because I don't have the uh, manpower. 
Uh, most of the time, it's just my father and myself. Sometimes my sister helps us out. But uh, you can't, or for me, I, I can't seem to, uh, uh, I can't seem to acquire any, any help. If I had a few guys that would help, I could grow more stuff, you know, because there's a lot of hand labor involved in vegetables and stuff like that. Uh, these big farms, they, uh, they have a lot of help. They have a lot of help that comes in from Puerto Rico, uh, from down, uh, down south. Uh, in uh, California, they have a lot of Mexicans that help. You know, and it, they got, you know, a lot of, they have the hand labor to do these things, you know, and uh, where we don't. These farms, these big farms, seem to be becoming like corporations. Well, that's basically what they are. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about how those, how they all work, and how that can affect you? Well, like I told you, uh, they're big corporations. They're owned by uh, uh, four or five individuals that uh, have, you know, different different jobs. One guy will grow the product, another guy will sell it, and another guy will, pa will uh, uh, pack it. And, you know, they have, they have every, everything right down, you know, to their own trucks and even their own supermarkets in some cases, you know, where, these, where the product goes. Uh, take, they've, got a lot, they've got an awful lot of money, you know, if you put five people like that together, a lot of these people had money to start with and they just invested it in a big operation and uh, you know they they can you know put to, they can put the small guy right out of business because you know uh, like me for instance uh, I, I grow my own potatoes and I pack my own but uh, you know I, I can't uh, go out and buy my own trucks to deliver them and stuff like that so I have to depend on somebody else to be buying them How's the smallest farmer going to survive? I don't know. I really don't know. I just, uh, things have to change. That's all I can tell you. A lot, you know, these big corporations, that's all right. So they're all right, but uh, uh, a lot of times they're very sloppy. They're not uh, as meticulous as a small farmer. So maybe uh, in the future, uh, things will work out so that the small farmer is again appreciated, you know, for the quality product that he can put up. This year being a rough year for you, um, did you ever get the feeling like you might not be able to survive this year? Take the losses, absorb the losses? Well, yeah, oh yeah, I think about it, but um, mostly um, it's this year is kind of a wait and see situation, see how things go. You know, hopefully later on maybe. Uh, Price will, prices will change a little bit and come out of it one way or another. So I hope you that not farm? Me? I hope not. Could you ever see yourself doing anything else but working on a farm? Not really. No, not really because uh, this is where my heart is. I, uh, I love it, you know, and uh, I don't think I could go work for anybody else myself. Even all through the hard times and all, you really want to stick with it? Oh yeah, I'd stay with it if I could, sure. If God willing, I'm going to try to stay with it. If I might not grow as many potatoes as I did this year. I might, you know, grow, grow a few more things, uh, mostly uh, concentrate on the small stuff, the uh, vegetables and stuff like that, and hopefully try to make a living that way. If, if uh, it gets to a point where things get a little rough, well, maybe I'll have to find something to do during the winter, but uh, my, my life ambition is to, is to be a farmer and to stay farming. There's a lot of, with that ambition of yours, there's still a lot of pressure, like you were saying before, with, from the real estate people and from developers. How can you go about withstanding that, especially in the way that East Hampton and Bridgehampton and this whole area has been changing so much to like a playground for a very wealthy group of people? Well, you see, we own our own farm, and if I was to uh, not grow potatoes and grow mostly green stuff, vegetables and such, I could make a living for myself right here on this farm, and I wouldn't really have to worry about anybody else, you know, if I didn't grow any potatoes. It really wouldn't hurt me. I could grow, 
I could grow enough vegetables and stuff and market them myself to make a make a living for myself, you know. So. One other thing, um, how does it work out with you and banks and all? I mean, do you have any other way of getting credit at all? Any other creditors at all? Do you have to always go through banks? Uh, well, there's pr pr Production Credit Association in Riverhead. Uh, and FHA and uh, the Federal Land Bank. You don't have to really. You don't really have to. Uh, there's there's a few creditors around. Yeah, I mean you don't have to specifically go through like Bridgehampton Bank or East Hampton uh, Bank in East Hampton. You know, or anything like that. I mean there's there's other creditors. How come there, there were so many more acres planted this year across the country than before? Well, a lot of guys, you know, they had a good year. They had a pretty good year last year and the year before that. And uh, they just increased their acreage. You know, uh, up in Maine, you see, they they were borrowing money for uh, anywhere from, they were, they were borrowing money at a real low interest rates. And so a lot of these guys, they just borrowed more money and more money and put it all in the ground, you know, and figuring, well, they thought maybe they could make a really big hit this year, you know. They figured maybe the price would go up and, you know, they would, uh, they would you know, really see a good return. Uh, I re was reading uh, <clears throat> where out west, um, I forget the, ex the name of the state, but there was a few f farmers out there that grew mostly corn and wheat, soybeans and stuff like that, and they weren't making a lot of money, so they even planted potatoes. You know, they didn't plant the wheat and the corn this year. They, they plowed their land and planted potatoes, so, you know, there was an increase there, too. And down, down south in Delaware and stuff, there's a, there's a few pretty good-sized farmers down there, and they uh, increased their acreage. I guess everybody this year was looking for a good year, and uh, it didn't seem to work that way. Not yet, anyway. Maybe things will change as time goes on. I don't know. Will the same amount of acres do you think be planted next year? No, I don't. I don't see it. Not around here, anyway. I think. Well, they claim. What was it? I think they claim that it was about 13,000 acres planted here this year, and. Uh, I think next year, if you see 8,000 acres planted, you'll be lucky. Because there's a lot of guys over on the other side of the island that uh, are so wrapped up in the banks now that, you know, they've, uh, they, they can't borrow any more money. So they have to auction out, you know. What is that like to go through when you see you know, your fellow farmer going through something like that? That, how does that get to you? It, it don't make me feel very good, you know, to see, uh, see these guys getting out of farming. You know, it uh, kind of gets discouraging. You know, I, I, uh, I really feel, I feel sorry for the people that this happened to. Some of it's self-inflicted through poor management, but uh, on the whole... Uh Let's take a, let take a walk over there, the tractor and stuff. Yeah, all right, sure. How long will it be until you finish uh, getting everything packed up this year's crop? Oh, probably, uh, probably the middle of February. Middle of February? Yeah. Depends. Do the standard time? Well, we've been done earlier before. A lot depends on uh, on the price and the movement, you know. And uh, we're we're going to move a few more probably till Thanksgiving, and then we may uh, slack up for a couple of weeks and um, you know just kind of see what the market does. Hopefully, maybe it might go up a little bit. I don't know. You know, it's it's hard to say. Jr. Oh Jesus! You everybody, you all you want. You behave yourself, Jay. Yeah. The equipment that you got out here is like you were talking about. Let me start over. The, the idea about cost of production. You were talking about uh, some of this equipment here, the things that you have to pay out. You want to 
to talk a little bit about that. Well, changes. just uh, the changes, say, in about four years. That, that tractor over there, I, I bought in 1980 and, oh, ran about 25,000. And uh, to replace that same tractor with that same amount of horsepower today, you're talking probably anywhere from forty to forty-five thousand dollars. So, you know, you, that's a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar increase. Uh, if you were to trade that tractor in, you'd probably get what you paid for it, if not more, today. But uh, it's still a big difference, you know, in in the way things have changed so much. Uh, it's it's hard to go out and buy new equipment with the prices that we've been having. Yeah. Um, the way it should be, uh, every five years you should be able to. Uh, every five years you, you should be able to replace a machine. And uh, last, and the way things have been going the last few years, you, there's no way you can afford to do that. And that's the uh, that's one of the disadvantages right now. To, the way things are. And this cost increase is probably effective in, uh, in your pesticides and fertilizer. Oh yeah, uh, pesticides have gone up. Uh, this year the, the spray bill wasn't so bad, but uh, in the last few years where we didn't have uh, the new pesticide that they came out with, uh, the cryocide, um, where we were using a lot of the old things in combinations with other things, just trying to kill the potato bugs, that was that was proven to be quite costly. Um, I don't know, it costs it costs roughly about two hundred dollars an acre to uh, spray your potatoes. I mean, that's one of the costs. Why don't you take us over? Do you have over in there? Do you have some uh, like old cans of that stuff over in there? No, I don't. Do you have any anywhere? Any, no, we no pesticides cans. No, we stuff? cleaned everything up. Did you? Mm. Did you? Yeah, we don't we don't like to keep it hanging around too long. You know, if we get done in the uh, if we get done in the fall and we don't need it anymore, instead of paying for it, we you know ship it all back and get credit for it because there's really no sense having it on hand. What do you use these barns for over here? Uh, small ones. We got a shop in there, there and walk over there. it's kind of messy right now. <laughs> but uh, we got to uh, keep our tools and stuff in there. And, Keep uh, oil products and stuff in this other little building. Right. Do you do most of your repair work and things like that? Yeah, because you can't uh, you can't afford to uh, hire anybody out to do anything for you anymore. Uh, the labor costs for doing things is so expensive. This is messy, fellas. <laughs> but. Yeah, we we try to fix everything ourselves that we can. You know, we we do most all our own work. Uh huh. Um, it's much more cost efficient that way. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, uh, you know, sometimes we can you know only fix what needs to be fixed for now, and yeah. later on this winter, you know, we'll go over the same truck or tractor again, and you know, fix it the way it ought to be fixed. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, you have to, in today's times you have to uh, you have to fix your own equipment. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we even do our own carpentry work around here. Yeah. You know, matter of fact, my father and I uh, we had a guy build this building, but um, oh, I'd say we did about 60 percent of the work to it ourselves. Uh -huh. You know, we he told us what to do, and we just uh, did what he told us to do. But my father and I did most of the work, really. He laid it out for us, and we put it up. Yeah. You know, because uh, we had to, we had to uh, shave some of the cost off if we could. You know. Yeah. And uh, that's what it's all about. You know, you have to be cost efficient. Yeah. These barns over here is where you store most of your potatoes. Yeah, Let's we store them. most potatoes over there, and. Uh, How long have these uh, barns been here? Uh, they've been here for about. Well, see, this barn here has been totally renovated at one time. Uh, why don't we walk into the back there and you can show us that. Yeah, it's, it's been renovated? Yeah, it would, this barn here is probably about 40 years old, 45 years old, okay. the way it is now. So it's been used for storing potatoes? Yeah, uh, well, at one time, watch this mud puddle. At one time, it, uh, 
it was used for a horse barn, you know, because we used to do all the work. Well, when my father and his father were uh, farming all the time, they, uh, before the tractors came out, they used horses, so they needed a place to store the, you know, keep the horses and everything. And uh, it really, it was a horse barn. And uh, then they, re you know, renovated it when they started uh, to get equipment and things like that, and they stored potatoes in it. Uh -huh. Can you open it up for us? Sure, you come on over here and I'll show you, you can see. How many potatoes do you store in? Uh, this barn here, we put about 100 loads in if we have to. How many pounds would that be? Uh, well, it usually runs about 15,000 pounds to a load of potatoes. Uh -huh. So probably 150,000 pounds. A lot of spuds. Yeah, it's quite a few spuds. You can see, I don't, I don't know if you got light enough. If you can see the old roof of the old barn, you can see where they added on. It used to all be dirt floor, and uh, you know, my father, he poured a lot of cement in here, made the floors, and set up the bins for the potatoes and everything like that. And, uh, that's where the old barn used to stop, right there. Uh -huh. Right where that big header is, and you can see part of the old roof still up there. And they just built right over top of it. Huh. How long has uh, your family been out here farming? Well, oh, I'd say. About 60 years. 60 years? 65, 60, 60 to 70 years, I'd say. So your, fa your father grew up out here with his family? My father was born right, oh. you know, right here. And uh, my grandmother and grandfather came over from Poland. And uh, they started uh, working for other people. And eventually, my grandfather bought his own farm and bought some of his own land and uh, you know, continued farming himself. And then my father took it over. And, uh, you know, ever since then, it's been, pa you know, it's been passed down from my grandfather to my father and then to me, you know, my father and I are farming together now, but uh, someday I hope to continue farming too, you know. And how about your children? Do you feel that they'll get into farming too, your son? Uh, I don't know. Like, it's not a bad, uh, there's a lot of satisfaction in it, you know, and uh, everything's going right, so. You know, hopefully we'll have, it's kind of a wait and see situation, you know, see how things progress in the future. If, uh, I wouldn't like to, I'd, I'd like to see them hold on to it if they could, but uh, it depends a lot on what the times are. If uh, your son came to you and asked you, you know, like and the relationship was the same as the one with you and your father right now and things were going bad and everything and he, he just couldn't keep going with it and everything, how would that? How would that feel, the end of that tradition out uh, here? Yeah. It'd probably hurt, but, you know, I can't blame him. I couldn't blame him for bettering himself either, you know, and hopefully uh, he'll have a good education and everything, and he can go on to do something else, and maybe someday uh, he'll be able to uh, have this plus do something else. Who knows, you know? And yeah. A lot depends on what the future brings. Yeah. Um, I don't, with all the development and everything that's going on around here, I don't think you'll see potato farming stay in this area for a lot more years, but who can tell, you know, you can't tell. Since your family was farming out here, how many acres have you added on to? Well, the home farm here runs about 40 acres, and Plus the land that we rent, well, it's almost close to about, we rent about 160 acres of land, so, because we usually try to uh, rest about, oh, we usually try to rest at any, about 50 acres a year, so that we have, you know, new ground every year, you know. We only try to grow potatoes at only two years on the same piece of ground. You know, otherwise you'll be stretching it too far, you know, and you won't get the crops that you should be getting. Yep. Most of the homes out here that are built out in the middle of the fields, when did they start, first start coming, coming around? When did they first start yeah. coming around? Yeah. Oh, I'd say 
I don't know, about, really about eight years ago, eight to ten years ago, uh, things were really just starting, and uh, then all of a sudden, it was like a big boom, and everybody was building houses like crazy out here. And then uh, I, I've noticed myself in the last year or so, things kind of slowed down a little bit. People, I don't think the real estate is uh, moving as fast as it was. Why do you think that is? Well, the land is very high priced, and uh, with the uh, way things are, this past year, uh, I don't, you don't see a lot of people spending a lot of money. Uh, the only ones that are spending the money are the ones that really have the money, but uh, the, a lot of people that used to buy things on credit and stuff like that, they're not, uh, they're, they're being very careful about what they're buying. You know, they're not, uh, they're not buying things like they used to. Yeah. Now you hear a lot about the, the Bridgehampton soil. What, what is it about the soil out here that's so? Well, it's a right combination of, uh, there's a certain amount of sand in it and, uh, uh, humus and all, and a little bit in clay and all those things mixed together. I guess it makes up the, what they call a Bridgehampton loam. And uh, they claim it's some of the best soil in the country for growing potatoes. And, you know, we just get some pretty good crops from it. There's some bad spots around, but you know, on the whole, there's some real good land around here. I think some of the finest in the world. Yeah, I see you're growing other things too, besides uh, potatoes this year. Yeah, you have to grow a little bit. You know. Uh, I, I always grow a few acres of sweet corn, and some cabbage, and cauliflower. Uh, I like that little bit of extra, you know. I, I work it myself, and yeah, it helps. You know, I'm able to get what I want and, you know, do things like that. It, uh, I could grow more if I had more help, you know. And I have a, some of my own uh, stores I take care of, and works out really well. I've been doing it for about six, seven years now, and uh, I've done I've done pretty well at it. I can't complain about it. Uh, this year is one of my worst years with it because uh, the, when the hurricane came in, it uh, it ruined mo uh, well, it ruined about 90% of my cauliflower. Uh, the wind came in from the southeast and blew the frame frame leaves. You know, the big leaves on the cauliflower blew them all one way, and then when the wind switched. It came out of the west, it snapped all the leaves back, and uh, a lot of the cauliflower lost its leaves, and the uh, salt blowing in off the ocean, being that I'm so close to the ocean over here, I'm about, oh, about three quarters of a mile to a mile away, the salt was very intense during the storm, and uh, it burned a lot of the heads that were already formed. It turned them brown. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of the uh, trees that face the south, the south sides of the trees, they all got uh, burned very bad too. It looks just like winter set in, you know, full force. What do you have growing over here on here? I've got uh, I've got oats growing. Uh, I rested this land this year. I left it uh, foul. I uh, changed my crop. Uh, see, we we had been planting potatoes here for two years, and then it was time to. Uh, give it a rest and do something different with it and uh, so I'm planting oats. Oats has a uh, real long tap root and it breaks up the hard pan uh, very good and next year when we plow this ground under it will be very soft and very workable and, uh, and when you have ground like that it's very very suited for potatoes. Potatoes you know really grow well. The first year, the first year is 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 good year after rested ground, but usually the second year, sometimes the third year is the second and third year. You you usually get your best crops off rested ground. And we we don't like to uh, push a land too hard. You push it too hard, uh, you drain it for all it's worth, and uh, you won't get good crops. You know, three years is about the maximum. But we like to rotate it every two if we can, you know, if it's possible. Some gets a little bit stretched, but no more than three. Did you ever think you'd see houses out here? Did I ever think when I was growing up? Not really, because uh, I didn't. I didn't expect it. But as as I've grown, 
Uh, I can see where things have tra changed tremendously. Uh, it's unbelievable. I can remember as a kid, you could walk from here to Sagaponic and not see but a couple houses that were, and they were farmhouses. But no more. It's uh, it's all these new modern houses. It's uh, in a way, it's sickening. Um, I don't know. It's uh, the the people are coming in here and they're just chasing the local people right out and they're even taking over as far as the government and everything like that. You know, you don't see any local people involved anymore. Really, it's all out of towners, and that that part of it hurts. You know. Uh, do you ever think that you'll sell your land? You'll do I ever that? think that I will? Things have to get pretty damn bad. Uh, I I hope not. I hope I never uh, never faced with that situation. Real estate agents trying to become pretty friendly with you? Oh yeah, they've they've called and inquired and said if I ever change my mind to let them know. But I'm in no hurry to do anything right now. And there's, there's somebody that I don't really need to know right now. Um, when you decided to start working on uh, farming and all, did you, did you know it would be for you like a lifelong type of, uh, besides just a way of life, something that you really love? Did I, uh, did I think that it would be a lifelong? Look this your life. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping it was. I liked it that much, you know. Uh, when I was growing up, when I was younger, my mother even had a hard time uh, keeping me home because when my grandfather was alive, I always used to ride around with him. And when he was out in the fields working, I would ride on the tractor with him. And I guess from that point on, everything uh, that was happening interested me. And. Uh, it was hard for me to, it would be hard for me to pull away from it. I, I, I love it right now. Um, I hope that I can stay in it. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's a lifelong thing for me. Yeah. The way things are changing, do you ever get the uh, feeling that it might not be? Unfortunately, yes. Around here, yeah. Uh, a lot of people have said, you know, if I want to farm and everything like that, I should uh, move. But a lot of those people that are saying those things to me, they're uh, they're older people, and they've got uh, they've had good years, and things have worked out for them where you know they have a little bit of money stored away and stuff like that, and you know they're up the way things are set up for them. They can uh, you know they could sell everything out here and have enough money and everything like that to move someplace and. You know, start over, but uh, myself. You know, I'm just starting out, so uh, everything I make is kind of got a destination point. You know, I'm paying off my house and uh, paying off a piece of equipment or something like that. You know, uh, it's it would be very difficult for me to just pack my bags and leave here to go someplace else. So. I'm kind of hoping that I can stick it out here and, you know, make something of it. Maybe in the future, you know, it's hard to say what's going to happen. You know, maybe things will be totally different. And I, you know, if I want to really stay into farming, I may be forced to uh, think on, along those lines where I would have to actually move from this area to go to another area to farm if that's what I wanted to do. But right now, this is right now. This is where it's at for me. When will it be that you start planting again and start going through the whole other process of preparing to uh, do your harvest? Uh, well, right after we get done packing potatoes, you know, if we get done the first part of February, we'll probably have to we'll work on some of our equipment and get that ready. And, you know, that's all part of uh, working towards the next harvest, too. You know, you have to get your equipment prepared and everything. and. Before we actually get out and work the ground, it's usually, you no, know, probably maybe the third week in March, depending on how the weather uh, is changing. Sometimes, sometimes you don't get out there until the second week in April. You know, it all depends on how the sprint, how things are shaping up. 
And but it's usually around March, April, March, or end of March or first part of April that you really get going. You think your father will stay in it for a couple more years with you? Oh yeah, I think you'll see him hanging there. You know, he needs something to do. Yeah. How does he feel about all of the things going on? He's probably one of the people who uh, might be wanting to give you some advice now and then. What kind of things does he say to you? Well, what he says to me, he he just says, be careful about what you do, and uh, you know, don't don't overextend yourself into anything. You know, I mean, as far as spending money or anything like that, he says. Just try to get by with what you need for now and see how things progress. Yeah.